Hi, I'm Dan Robinson with the Great Lakes Spirituality Project, and I'm here talking with Wynn Curlfink. Wynn is a therapist and group didactic treatment specialist with Agira Health Incorporated in Southeast Michigan. And he has master's degrees in clinical existential, phenomenological psychology, family ecology, and environmental sociology. He's also a member of St. Philip Lutheran Church in Trenton, Michigan, where he's helping to start the Perennial Waters Project, which is a community-led working group cultivating mindful partnerships for sustained ecological activism. Well, welcome, Wayne. I'm very glad you're here today. Thank you. It's my honor to be here. Thanks for making the time. Um, let's start off right away with the Perennial Waters Project. Can you talk a little bit about what that's what that's about? Uh, sure. Um, uh, and Beth gets about a month ago. You had John Hardig as a guest, and he's. Uh, He's somebody who's been a longtime member of the church. I've come to join recently, and and I met him, and uh, um, it didn't actually. He's just a great guy that I'd met. Uh, and I'd met a church, and didn't quite understand the the um, um, what an, a kind of impressive resume he has, and he's in fact all the more beautiful a person than simply what his resume says. Terrific guy. He uh, he. We were talking, and he was just sort of sh thinking about what it is we. It would be really interesting to kind of uh, start a, uh, a a kind of ministry, um, if that's what. I mean, I think in terms of the church we belong to, that's what we call it. But really, some community outreach of some sort. Um, and since I'd had voiced an interest in uh, environmental matters and and talked about how much I love the region, we my adopted region, the downriver region of, uh, of uh, the Detroit River, the confluence of the Detroit River and the Huron River at Lake Erie. Um, uh, we really got to talking and, and pretty passionate about all things wetlands and all of these sorts of things. Uh, what would we do if we could? And, uh, you know, he's a busy guy and he really uh, is up to lots of phenomenally interesting things. And uh, I'm new to the area. I come to work in, in addiction treatment, and uh, I was really itching for some way to kind of do something, just something that's um, particularly relevant to the region that, uh, our, that our church sits in. Um, and uh, it really was just that. Well, what would we do if we could? And it was just the two of us, and uh, quite importantly, uh, this young, fantastic young pastor at our church, who's uh, enthusiastic and and uh, really brings a lot of energy. Um, uh, Brandon Hunt, who uh, so the three of us had been kind of batting around ideas about what what we might do, uh, and um, so it you know events timing of events just opened up there was uh it was at that time he was just beginning to uh doing some other presentations on um some work he'd long since been doing uh, kind of the history of the region the environmental history of the really disastrous ways that industry had treated the region and the famous uh fires river fires of of uh, 50 now 51 52 years ago he'd done a lot of historical reading um and writing and research. And of course, he's done so much hands-on conservation work as well. So um, the idea was, uh, if, you know, there must be something to do to kind of reach out into the community, not as a church. We're just some folks that are at this church. We're not trying to get, uh, and really quite honestly, we're not trying to build church membership. Great if we do, but really we want to do something in this region. Uh, in this local space that we live in and really are in love with. And uh, what would that be? So, you know, right off, well, let's start by giving a talk. That seems like a good place to build enthusiasm, invite some folks. And he's very networked, obviously, and I'm new to the region, so I'm not. And um, uh, give a talk, uh, a presentation on the history, the 50 years since the since the Rouge River caught fire and what has transpired since, all of the conservation efforts to clean it up and bring essentially a dead river back to life and have done so just miraculously. Um, and there's still some work to be done, but um, 
really talking about the successes that have taken place here. At the same time, uh, you know, look around, there's plenty of work to do. Um, so, you know, and so I bring a whole other kinds of uh, set of ideas that uh, trying to figure out where they fit together um, has been its own interesting journey. And of course, COVID hit, so it really delayed things for quite some time here. Yeah, sure. But, but really, that's all we are right now is, is we have given some some talks and we're building some interest and in, in developing. So we've got a couple of small projects that are at our scale, what we can do right now. And they're exciting in their own way. And uh, and as, as we generate interest, maybe folks in the region and with the modern technology such as this, perhaps from folks who love our region or anybody who's interested in something like this, uh, join in, be a part of a conversation about how we can um, do activist work. So ultimately what this is, is there's two pieces. There's activism and there's the kind of sustaining of that activism. You know, there are some folks who are, uh, I probably fit into this camp, those of us who really do a lot of thinking and contemplative work and, and how do we, um, how do we really think about how we're moving forward and sustain that as opposed to the folks who just want to, you know, march outside the McLeod steel plant as, as finally as being torn down, but uh, a, a real um, industrial uh, site of mismanagement that is in Trenton and has been a problem and, uh, and has a, a very active activist group that has been working to get that site cleaned up, get the owners to, to do something with it so, so it can be uh, used in some way as, as a, a you know, clean up the brownfield cleanup and, and uh, or, you know, if developed, a lot of developers have been talking about doing something with it, but um, well, you know, hopefully it, not. Well, hey, go ahead. Like, yeah, so it sounds like the group is one that sort of tries to combine some activism action, practical action, right? reflection and sort of thinking about and, and, and praying about or, or trying to bring sort of the emotional, spiritual side of things to that action. And then sure. Sure. so I want to get back a little bit to the activist side of that um, in a minute here, but I want to talk about sort of your own roots to, to coming to this. Now you talked about living uh, downriver or um, for those of us that don't live in the Detroit River area, the the, the um, St. Uh, Clair River comes into Lake St. Clair between Huron and Erie, and the Detroit River flows out. And just before it hits Lake Erie, the Huron River comes in from the west. Do I understand that correctly? Uh, yeah, I, th I think it. I think it meets meets Lake Erie just a just a mile or so south of where the okay. Detroit River uh, opens up into. So so it's that sort of confluence region there. Sure. So you moved to that area back in uh, 2016, is that right? Yeah, yep. Yeah, so uh, talk a little bit about your, if you don't mind, your, your own personal connection with with that region and with the Great Lakes in general. Um, so I was born in Pittsburgh uh, and have always had family in um, uh, north, in gr the Grand Rapids region, and uh, there's a, a some sort of second cousins now after after the generations have so if, if time has passed but uh have a beautiful a, a beautiful uh spot up north of grand rapids 30 miles or so on a lake up there and so uh it was one of those places it's interesting i've heard some of your guests talk so much about the same kind of thing their experience <laughs> growing up going going to this lake now, so so my great aunt would open the book every year and say well when are you going to be here and and uh, it was ours for a week or two weeks or something growing up. And this continued on all the way through through high school. And then it, in some form or other, I mean, I spent a little time with my cousin there this summer. I, I you, you know, my summers in, in those waters are pr profoundly um, uh, some of my greatest memories. You know, if I spent two or three, when I was especially small, two or three weeks every summer, uh, for all I knew, it was all summer long, and uh, my certainly my best memories of, of my childhood were uh, on Whitefish Lake in uh, uh, Montcalm County, and um, 
and just just out there in the water. And as I got a little older, getting out into the canoe and just you know being by myself all day long uh, or with cousins, I have a, uh, but simply just being uh, being out there. I go back to Pittsburgh, and, and as I got a little older too, you know you, you know Pittsburgh's a beautiful city. Uh, it's it's very interesting in its own right for uh, the three rivers that and a lot of the convers conservation efforts going on there. That's all interesting, but that my my heart wasn't necessarily into that into that when I was younger. Certainly, um, I came here sort of by you know I, I met a woman who had moved uh, to Pittsburgh for for a brief time and. Uh, uh, for some variety of circumstances, we wound up moving up here in 2016, and um, uh, there was uh, her grandmother. Had, her grandmother had passed. With her house was sort of available for us to move into, and needed some restoration work. And that's how we landed in, in this particular spot. Now, I wasn't all that infatuated with the region uh, at the time, but. Uh, but it didn't take long, you know. My I always sort of set myself. Oh, I'll come to Michigan with you, but we're we're gonna go west, Lake, Lake Michigan shoreline. That's where. And uh, um, but there are some things that really captured my heart about about where we are. Sure. So you, um, I think you in in some of the stuff that you sent me, you talked about having a, a particularly transformative moment, if I understood it correctly, at Point Mouillet. Could you, could you talk a little bit about that? Where's that located exactly, and, and how what was that experience? Uh, so Point Moliere is is really about the the deepest point of what we would call downriver, south of Detroit. Uh, it's down in it's no longer in Wayne County. It's um, uh, it's Monroe County, uh, but it is. Uh, I think I think that really is the confluence of where the Huron River meets Lake Erie. And it's a vast stretch of wetlands. Now, it was, a, it was a region, as I understand it, that was just devastated uh, with toxic waste and with, uh, with mismanagement. It had been back in the 1800s, a, uh, a just a beautiful stretch of wetlands. And, and some of the big industrialists went duck, hunting, duck hunting in there. And uh, so it was sort of famous in a way for that. Or a lot of folks who... Um, uh, whose whose job it was, whose um, careers were based on just shuttling these industrialists in and out of uh, from say Rockwood or one of the little towns down there into this into this um, marshland and boating them in there and, and getting them around. But um, uh, so it's this this vast region of wetlands, and as I understand it, it, it had been so devastated and so dumped on, and that uh, some so approximately 20 years or so ago, there was a fairly massive environmental conservation effort uh, restoration program that went in there, um, sponsored as much by the DNR as the, I think, Doc Hunters Unlimited, one of these groups. And uh, so by the time I had gotten in there, uh, it a lot of work, beautiful work had been done. It was this vast stretch of marshland. And... Uh, uh, you know the opening scene of the Lion King when it opens up, and <laughs> and there are just birds of of dinosaur proportions flying through everything. And I walked in there one summer day, and and it may be as much of a sort of imaginative memory as as anything. But I walked in there, and it, it felt sort of like that. There were so many large wetland water birds, the ones that I many of which I'd never really seen before, but I, I went in there and um, was was just knocked knocked off my feet. And uh, and, and as the story that I've told is that uh, I, I saw a lot of pelicans. And um, so I really spent the afternoon, and there was a beautiful July day, I think, and uh, I just spent the afternoon just walking and finding a spot and sitting and, and just just utterly um, there aren't words you know you've had these kinds of experience yeah, it's yeah. what it's what it, this is the kind of thing that, that uh, it, it, John Philip Newell uh, who's a 
beautiful author um, calls a, a thin place. It's yes. the, 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 the distance between the presence, the divine presence and whatever it is that separates me from that on an ordinary day is just here we are. Um, and I, and, uh, but these pelicans just played with me, you know, <laughs> just dozens of them flying overhead and landing. And I, I have seen pelicans. I've been to Florida and I know pelicans when I see them. Nobody really believes me when I'm talking about it. And uh, I try, you know, I go on the internet, I'm looking, there's no, there's some reports about some pelicans being sighted in, in uh, uh, Lake Michigan on the other side of the state, but there's not, nothing I kind of like. Uh, come on, folks. I know a pelican when I see it, but you know, eventually some of these reports have come up, come along. But um, and I and I haven't seen them since. I've been in and out of there, in and out of there a lot. And uh, but uh, you know, they, I would assume, pelicans had always come up here to summer, and they do. They come north in summer, and uh, but you know, nobody was really talking about pelicans in Point Moye. So. Uh, you know, and this is right at the point when I'm thinking, well, yeah, we could, you know, this is 2013. I was coming up with my wife and family and visiting in the summer, but we hadn't yet really talked about about um, about moving up here. Uh, so, you know, I, I was really not interested in moving to the region other than, you know, this is where uh, we have two little boys. And this is where, of course, uh, their grandparents live, which is certainly a, a relationship I don't want to interfere with. So um, coming into, that, coming into that, that vast wetland and seeing pelicans and seeing all these other water birds, just, uh, that was it. I, I, could, I could just hear this. I could feel it as one of those sort of uh, just knocked me over. And uh, a very deeply spiritual experience. You know, it's one of those things you say it like that. It's like, oh yeah, I know we've all this whatever. Wink, wink. I don't know how else to say it except for it was. It, it's uh, you know, it's a it's a moment that comes back on me. It's and um, so 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 here. We are. Isn't it funny how those moments we get those moments in our lives? I mean, I've had them too. Uh, mine have tended to be more on Lake Michigan, but mm -hmm. um, where you suddenly find yourself in a relationship that you didn't expect in that moment it sounded like yeah. to you it was with the birds and the pelicans for me at different times it's been with the water mm -hmm. and um and so i, I it, i'm curious as you as you sort of carry that experience forward into this idea of starting this perennial waters group um have you run across other people as you've had these conversations about who have had you know that reminds me of how i had this experience Mm -hmm. place or that place have you, have you talked to people about that well i have and and you know it's i'm guessing it's not really just a michigan thing but it sure is a michigan thing i mean a lot of <laughs> the michigan is just surrounded i mean we we bordered by four of the five great lakes and uh um is is, is that right i mean yes all four of them touch this this state and uh and uh, while we're in the lower peninsula, you know, we've spent a good deal of time up, up north as well. In fact, I have an uncle up in um, uh, up on the Menominee River, just uh, just at the border. He's not far from Iron Iron Mountain, Michigan. And, and uh, you know, if you so, um, but you know, a, a lot of the folks in Michigan I know of, you know, just well, well, yeah. I mean, it's just sort of this given. They there's there's this there's this mythic nether region of of for everybody. Everybody's got their own their own mythology of what up north is. Up north, you know, in Pennsylvania, those folks maybe they have camp. They go off to camp every summer or something. But there's up north in Michigan, and and it doesn't even necessarily have to be north. It's just it's on a lake somewhere. Right. And, uh, um, and like this place where I spent time every summer, it's uh, there, there's, you know, there's a pr profound spirituality about about my relationship with this place, which, by the way, opens up a uh, another part of the conversation about what, about what what we really mean by the place that uh, that we're talking about and, and what our relationship is to it. So 
I, you know, half the people I know in Michigan will say, well, yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. It's in a very sort of lighthearted way. I, sure, I go up there and I, I, I don't know what I would do if I didn't spend some time up there every summer. And uh, um, uh, you, you, and you interviewed one, one gentleman who was a, as I, a, a philosophy professor, a Hindu, and from New York or something, or, or, yeah. or works teaches in New York. Dr. Christopher uh, Feedy, yep. And he was talking about his experience up in the thumb area of being on, in Lake Huron. Uh, well, well, yes, that's you know, <laughs> this is a, a, an essential part of my summer experience. And sure. Uh, sure. Well, you, you, you started to go there, so I'm going to take us there, I think. Um, in, the, in the document you sent me, the proposal about um, the Daniel Waters project, you talk about or write about the importance of place. Um, in, in particular, you write, the unifying theme across all concerns about the perennial water project, which is to consider, is our reverence for place. Our identities and languages, our ethnicities, our regional dialects, these constitute many, for many of us, the ground of our being. So it sounds like all these sort of experiences that we individually have um, in certain places sort of tie together in this concept or this principle of reverence for place. Do I understand that correctly? Sure. sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's so, there's, so many, there's so much beautiful literature that so much great poetry about this kind of stuff. And there's a, a great body of philosophy that talks about this pretty well. And, but, but and not as much as I'm, I might think, but, but, you know, if I'm going to talk about how I feel when I, when I step onto the beach at Lake Michigan and I put my feet in, in and I look at the dunes everywhere and excuse me, or how I feel when I visit Point Moyet, um, how I feel about my neighborhood, my my local region, my my front yard, maybe. Um, whether I have any kind of spiritual sensitivities or not, there's something to that story. Uh, you know, we all like hey, that's my neighborhood. Look at the uh, any sort of social group you can think of, and we a lot of our social identity has to do with where we're from, and it's. It's, it's not hard to spot, right? We have an accent. We come from one spot or another. If I'm, I'm from Pittsburgh, and you know, in Pittsburgh, we kind of tend to talk like this, and we go over to the North Side, and we there's this accent that is, that is uniquely Pittsburgh, and it's it's not very pretty, but it's I know it when I hear it. Um, we we are from somewhere, uh, and the interesting thing to me about that is our this thing of at the very center of each of our lives, which is the same thing that is at the very center of each of, of our, the, our relationships, which is at the, our spiritual center, which is the same as that which is at the very center of my relationship with this place. Um, if I'm disconnected from that, and my then my relationship to this place is one of ownership. It's not one of stewardship. It's not one of... This I belong to this place, but it's one of this place belongs to me. This is a pretty familiar theme to you, I'm quite sure. Uh, we belong to the land; it does not belong to us. The kind of thing is here we live in in Detroit, Michigan, where there are has always been uh, movement, diasporas, folks, uh, and uh, um, and of course, uh, native traditions, um, First Nations folks. Uh, um, Wyandotte Indian folks that uh, have their headquarters in Trenton, Michigan, not far from from us. We all have a identity that's uh, whether that identity is kind of authentic or whether it's however we think of ourselves, where we are and what that place is to us has it's pretty inextricable. So what that means is, if I if the, if I really belong to this place, well, I I have no right more rights to it than you and anybody else. This, this is a Chris Thiele song. It, you know, this land is no more mine than yours, but but it but I sure I sure love being a part of it. Um, this place 
my my ownership of this place, whatever that relationship is, brings out the very worst of us and brings out the very best of us. Um, you know, look at what's going on in the world right now. Look at the look what happened, in, you know, last week and our our nationalism is about place. It's ugly. But our, our reverence to place, our uh, the very best of who we are, and the way that the way that we treat ourselves is the same as the way that we treat our our yard, our land, um, and uh, the way that we nurse it back to health. Coming back to Point Moyer, for example, the way that we treat each other, the way that we treat our land, we uh, this place my reverence to this place where I live, where it, I, I'm fed by it, uh, I am nurtured by it, it raises me. Um, you know, I belong to St. Philip's Church there in Trenton, Michigan, and you know, this is where the very best of us find each other in this beautiful spot together. Uh, and, um, we may not all be there forever. We may get up and move to some other part of the world or some part of the country or another part of the state, but, and um, hopefully we will feel just as connected to whatever place we land in that week. But I, I think, I think I just find it a kind of constant poetry to just never let myself forget as often as I can throughout the day, how, beautiful this place is that I am in, no matter how, you know, gray the snow is because it's, you know, later into the winter and it's all road salt. <laughs> it, here, we get to be here. That's a profoundly beautiful thing. Yeah. Now, I still live my ordinary daily life just like you do, and I'm not thinking about that most of the time, but every chance I get to come back to that means that I get to come back to that and somebody else who's come along to this region who has an accent of some sort has just as much right to be here as I do and embrace this place as I do. Um, which finally brings us to the idea of um, how how we get to honor each other in, in that reverence towards this place. How much reverence we have. And I hear spoken in, in your dialogues here, the reverence we have for those who've, who've in a sense been here the longest, who, who, you know, the First Nation folks who have, have such a profound reverence for this place. And those of us of European descent who for generations and generations lost any sense of this. And, you know, um, the idea that there can be a time when we we all, in a sense, in, in, in absolute honor to those who have been here and who've never lost that kind of tradition, that reverence, um, a, a kind of dawning where we all are a kind of new, as Heidegger would say, a new autochthony, a new indigene. Uh, we are in a truly of, of this land right here. Now, if I came along later, if somebody else has come along later, how is it that I could ever um, assume any kind of uh, uh, any kind of ownership beyond anybody else? Um, where do we come to finally meet each other together here, uh, so that you know we've lost? So we finally are able to kind of in a cultural consciousness sense grow beyond the kind of destructive things that are looming in in our culture right now sure, uh, sure. And that all every bit of that is connected to where we are and, and we we can't pull those two apart you had you had um at different times you had made reference to the sort of the dual side of that experience of being connected to a place the positive and the negative and, and I want to kind of and I talk a little bit about the negative side of things. In your, in your proposal, in the document you sent me about perennial waters, you talked a little bit about this concept of addiction 
And, um, and I was really, I really found that fascinating. And you write compulsive behaviors of persons and or industries that ignore physical symptoms and deny systemically destructive consequences demonstrate addiction regardless of scale. So you draw this connection between addiction at the per individual or personal level and the societal level. Um, so how are those similar and different and, and how do they connect to how we, uh, that relationship that we have with a particular place? Well, uh, going back to, for example, the, the story I told about seeing the pelicans at the point my egg, right? Here I was in a place that had been utterly decimated toxins had destroyed that place. We, as a culture, you know, the, the sort of industrialist, the European whoever, because it is it is the European descent folks who came in and built all of this stuff. They were ones in power with all the money and they built all this stuff and they dump it all into the rivers. And um, we look at what we have done to ourselves by just decimating what really are the lungs of our region, you know, this vast wetland. And we didn't know any better, I guess. Fine. I'm not really interested in, in blaming those folks for whatever they did. But here we are. We have some responsibility for for uh, for cleaning it up. Well, that's, that's, in a sense, that's no different than what, uh, in my personal life, what I had done in my earlier years by drinking or consuming whatever things seemed to be to entertain me at the moment. And, uh, and there's so, it was so destructive. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, I look at, so I, I look at a region that, that is coming back to life. And, you know, if, if you look at, you know, the Rouge river is such a good example as well. Here's, here's a river that has, there's waterfowl and all sorts of creatures that have come back when the toxins had literally choked it out. No oxygen could reach the bottom of that river. And, and it was a dead river. Well, look what we have done to ourselves. Uh, and, and, it, and, and we tend to talk about these things like as if they're different. Uh, um, be, well, naturally we do because it feels that way in our ordinary daily life. The river is not me. I'm not the river. I'm not this place. The place is. But um, the more time we spend in a kind of contemplative way about how and how we live and 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 uh, and that and, and that we are as opposed to as opposed to the description of who we are that we are that this place is uh we it is precisely the same reverence that i have for my own my own physical well-being as i do for this particular region we so my my personal recovery and my addictive behaviors, my addiction from the past is no different to see how this ties into this experience that I had in, in Point Moyet, for example. This here's a place that long before I came along is has is well into its its recovery. It's re it's restoration dredging, for example, as well, which is digging up all the unconscious material from from the from the wetlands and finding all kinds of things that we've dumped in there. Um, that's the restoration dredging that goes on in Point Moyet still uh, is no different than the, than the personal psychological work I do in sort of in contemplative thought uh, when I do or what we do when I, I lead an addiction treatment group and we're talking about our particular struggles. Now, this isn't necessarily the kind of conversation I'm going to have with ordinary folks, and you know, just trying to quit drinking. You know, we're not we're not in that space, but it's the same work. My my interest in 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 the the in our in our restorative work in a place like whatever this is is uh, is this is of exactly the same interest that it is that I feel better when I wake up tomorrow than I might have. If, if I'd done some destructive behaviors last night when I before I went to sleep, mm. um, recovery—the word that addiction folks use—is is is recovery, regardless of scale. That's 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 the work we get to do. What a profound honor and privilege! Sure, sure. Well, you know, um, 
you talk about recovery and it seems to me that 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 journey towards recovery has to have a feeling that there is a possible outcome is possible that it, mm -hmm. it is it is possible to make a change to do some, some things differently and you write in, in that document about perennial waters our point is not to be discouraged and i just have time for one more question i want to ask you about this because i think this is important our point is not to be discouraged but rather encouraged anew perhaps other generations have come this close to despair yet carried on so it's like it's like we could get to that moment of despair of thinking that recovery is not possible and yet other folks have done it we can do it too this has to be a work of encouraging us to forward so i guess my my question to you is what is your source of encouragement or hope as you go through this work? Huh. Um, you know, the, the first answer is simply I, 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 my wife and my family, my adult children, my younger children. Um, it's just if, if I, as long as I'm present uh it's i i think i'm a pretty naturally optimistic guy i just i just am i feel i feel encouraged every time uh, uh i walk into the room and there they are now, my my wife would probably laugh at that because there's times <laughs> i'm really distracted i'm really in my head and i can be kind of grumpy but um but usually my distractions are things like these conversations and i'm always enthusiastic about this stuff um, but um, I've had some experiences that I didn't get into some other experiences ever since I was a kid that have I've come to see at this point in my life have have um, have caused me to know something and i i don't ever know how to talk about this without it sounding kind of unbelievable or ridiculous or um just you know fantasy and and that is um and and it's been confirmed by people that who's 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 writing i very much admire and who've who've helped me to believe that I, what I have experienced, I think is true. That is that, you know, um, that there is, that my spiritual center is, is not just some idea. I know that I have, uh, that there is something that my, that is at the very center of my life and it is divinity. Now, so I happen to belong to with, I, and, and love this Christian church. My, my, my heritage happens to be Christian, but it's way bigger than that. Um, which is, by the way, the term where perennialism comes from, but in the perennial waters, the name of perennial waters, but it's, I know, I know God. And I, I know this personal relationship that I have, this, uh, it, but it's the very same thing I've read in, in uh, as I've come to imagine yoga, for it's just one inroads into this understanding, this connection between Atman and Brahman, that place where I am always plugged in to source, to however we decide to discuss it, whatever part of the world we come from. I, I know this. It's funny. Carl Jung was... was uh, was interviewed back in the 50s and he said this thing which was you know how he was asked about how you know his belief in god and he said well, i don't believe it i know i know it you know, just, what, what do you how what is how does that make any sense i i know this you know it sounds sort of almost arrogant um and i i don't oh, what i do know is that it's the most it's the giant mystery of this universe that none of us are ever gonna know anyway not in our little human brains we can't ever fathom what all of this means but it's beautiful uh, and i read things that that confirm this thing that i know from in texts from all over the world and all kinds of different histories 
Um, and so, and to be sure, I had these experiences when I was young that freaked me out. I, I used to, honestly, I used to pass out a lot. I was kind of a weak kid. I w wasn't always super healthy. I would, you know, I was sort of anemic and I would pass out and I would wake up and sometimes I was sick, sometimes I wasn't, but there, I had some experiences which when I came out of it, I I was pretty sure I, I, I had known, I had, and what I've come to understand is I had these experiences where ego was entirely destabilized. And I saw from, um, from the eyes of true self, if we're going to use that language. And it's, again, it sounds silly, and I don't talk about it very well or very because I, I don't know how to say it without. If I were listening to myself, I'd be going, oh, I'd roll my eyes a little bit. But um, so I haven't talked about it very much in my life. I know this is true, and and so, uh, so, the idea of of Advaita Vedanta or uh, unit of consciousness, how we see f from the point of view of uh, uh, universal consciousness. I think that's true. I think that's sort of what that hinted towards, or maybe what that was. But I think when, so when I hear folks talking about this, when I talk about what it means to, what it, my reverence towards this land is and who we are for the land that we are so blessed to inhabit, that, that it invites us every day to live here uh, in, in this space here. That's not my little measly little consciousness here. That's ours. And uh, it sounds all new agey and all Ann Arbor bookstore kind of stuff that I like to tease the folks at the Ann Arbor bookstore because because uh, I tease them because they're my people. But because I'm usually talking with people who really don't have a whole lot of patience for these kinds of conversations. But sure. that's that's so deep and true and powerful. But we it's, it's a very difficult thing to say we know. In, and have a sense of uh, humility about it. Sure, sure. Well, it's it's that's a great place to sort of wrap things up because we've kind of come full circle. You know, we started you talking about those experiences as a child in in canoeing and spending time in the waters of West Michigan. We've kind of come around back to those other childhood experiences that have been formative. So I. I, I really appreciate you opening up, Wynn, and, and sharing uh, this conversation with me today. It's been really enjoyable. I, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. As I am th for your uh, invitation, very much. Yeah, well, thanks. And, and, and hopefully we can reconnect and, and, and uh, talk some more at some point in the future. Yeah. I would like that. I, I, I wish you and, and the uh, Great Lakes Spirituality Project the, the very best. Uh, I really love what you're doing. Thanks. You take care. Thank you. Take care now.